Cup Association. And it's my pleasure and my honor to uh, introduce our next speaker, who really needs virtually no introduction. <laughs> That's enough. Everyone, everyone in Catholic health here knows Father Kevin O'Rourke. Uh, Kevin is uh, undoubtedly the dean of Catholic health care ethics. I don't know of anyone who has contributed more to Catholic health care ethics uh, by his books, his articles, his teaching, his talks. Uh, he has left his stamp on Catholic health care ethics in a way that I think uh, no one else has. Uh, Kevin is also a senior scholar and lecturer here at the Nice Wonder Institute. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce and welcome a friend and a mentor and a colleague, Father Kevin O'Rourke. Thank you. I'm glad, Ron, that you introduced me as a senior scholar. Uh, <laughs> he's half right, see? <laughs> you, you can fill in the blanks. Now, we're going to uh, talk about bioethics as a vocation during this presentation. And uh, I have in my hand something to move slides along and things like that. but. Really, I'm uh, not too well acquainted with this technology. Uh, just last week, I learned how to use an electric pencil sharpener. <laughs> so uh, if this thing breaks down, you'll know it's not the technology. It's not Bob Johnson's work. It's really uh, my inexperience. But bioethics as a vocation, we'll, we will be talking about three different things. This is a consideration of spirituality. This is a consideration of how people relate to their life and to God. So as we go through this talk then realize that we will be discussing the spirituality of what it means to be a bioethicist or what it means to participate in bioethical decisions. You see everyone who participates in a bioethical decision is not necessarily a bioethicist. But those who are bioethicists we will be addressing and we will be addressing also those who are interested in some form of decision making. I think I want to go back. First of all we'll be talking about three different things. We'll be talking about the vocation, the meaning of the word vocation, and we will be talking about the bioethics as a science, as a discipline, how it developed, how the term bioethics came into use and so forth. And then we will say how to prepare for the work, for the profession of bioethics. So those will be our three considerations. When we talk about uh, vocation and we ask what is a vocation, we have to realize that the word is taken in many different ways that from the original or from the root Latin for the term, the vocation is a calling. But in the idea of vocation as it's more specifically realized, we have two different types of calling. One to a way of life, and then we're so called to marriage, called to the single life, called to the religious life, called to the priesthood, things like that. Or we talk about a vocation to a profession. And most of our concentration during this presentation will be on vocation as a profession. We realize that vocation then is a calling from God, and the calling is based really upon our talents. We don't answer that call unless we have some understanding of what our talents are. Uh, when I was watching those uh, slides that Dr. Anderson presented, I said to myself, that's not my vocation for sure. <laughs> so you, you all realize, of course, that before choosing what you have been doing in life, you have been aware of what your talents are and what your ability of passing certain exams and going through certain study programs are. In the uh, notion of that calling from God, 
we have the idea that we answer. That that's also a responsibility. In the uh, talk that uh, Dr. Anderson gave, I was really thrilled with that notion of awe because that's the argument that John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman, uses from the natural point of view to talk about, to prove the existence of God. Once he proves that existence of God, however, he then goes to the revelation of what God is like. You know, that God is a father, that God cares for us, that God nurtures us, and so on and so forth. And uh, as uh, Dr. Anderson pointed out, we pray to God for the stability to accept and to live through the sorrows of life. But anyhow, that's uh, part of our response to God and part of the notion of the vocation. A vocation then, or a career or a profession, is also a call to service. To help other people achieve important goals in life. That's the meaning of service. But service, we have to realize, does not mean that one leads a miserable life or that one in pursuing some service, some career, is going to be, so we, shall we say, depressed about the notion of helping other people. No, in the idea of service, we find the realization, the fulfillment of who we are. And we find as we go through life that this fulfillment in the helping professions becomes more significant to us and becomes more, shall we say, realistic to us because we see the things that we're able to do for others and in these helping professions then we realize that giving service is not something that's a burden. It's not something that we should look upon as dreary or something we should ever think of as limiting our potential. The uh, professions who, that are developed are, uh, with service in mind then are of direct or indirect contact with the person giving service. You know, the direct contact would be, example, would be a nurse or a physician or someone has person-to-person -person relationship with the one who is being served. The direct form really has to do with what it's like to interact with people. The indirect form, of course, is very real. It's a very substantial part of our lives, but we don't have to be in contact with the person who offers the service. A good example, of course, is an automobile mechanic. How many people know the ones to whom they bring their car for service? And how well would you know them? But nonetheless, that person does give you an ability to live your life in a more commodious or a more facilitating manner because of the service that he or she offers you. The uh, cleaners and people of that nature you never probably encounter, but nonetheless, the service they offer you is real. Now, when we talk about bioethics, we're moving on to second part of our presentation. When we talk about bioethics, we're really talking about something <clears throat> that from the beginning of medicine and for the beginning of health care is something that's intrinsic to the practice. You know, at the beginning of medicine as a science, we can go back to that oath of Hippocrates or some of the other statements that were made by Arab philosophers and others with regard to medicine and regard to the ethics of treating medical people. Excuse me, of treating patients, of treating families who are in need of uh, medical care. It so happens, however, that in the 1960s and 1970s, philosophers and some theologians recognized that medicine kind of had lost its purpose and had become not a mutual effort to restore well-being to a patient. Notice I use the word well-being and uh, rather than health 
because there's more to medicine than health. Well-being is part of medicine as well. And it became obvious that many practitioners in the field of medicine were assuming decisions that should have been made by the patients. I had in uh, my own family, I had an experience of this. It was rather painful. My mother, uh, I was overseas, I was studying overseas. This is 50 years ago, in case uh, any of you didn't believe that senior scholar. Uh, <laughs> this was 50 years ago, and uh, I was studying overseas, and my mother became ill. My sisters and my brother had to care for her and had to had the responsibility of being their, her surrogate. Well, the physicians, and I'm not knocking these physicians, see, they were wonderful men, two physicians, brothers, best men in our town. But they were physicians. And at that time, you couldn't use the word cancer when you were talking to a family. So my mother was, you know, kind of uh, strange, acting kind of strange. And the doctor said, oh, she's got a... She has a nervous breakdown. So you better get her therapy. So my brother and sisters had my mother go through a lot of tests, you know, psychological tests and a lot of counseling. My mother had a tumor on the brain, cancer. Physicians knew what it was. But at that time, you see, the ethos of medicine was to not reveal the cause of aberrational behavior if it were cancer. So the idea then that medicine had turned, so to speak, turned in on itself and what became important was only what the doctor said. 